so I want to finish up soldering and then go into microelectronics joining and stuff. Um, what I haven't mentioned to you is this particular book, Soldering Electronics, Second Edition by Klein Washink. I haven't checked to see. It's published by the Electrochemical Society. I haven't looked to see if they've got a, a newer version, but uh, Klein Washink is a uh, is was a researcher at Philips in the Netherlands. This is 1989, so he may be well retired by now. But if you got an extra three, four hundred dollars, this is a great book to have. Okay, um, it actually has more details on solders and soldering from a scientific point of view than anything else. It's got creep data, it's got all kinds of stuff, um, which actually is something I haven't mentioned about. Another difference between soldering and brazing, which is this artificial difference, and that is solders are always in the creep regime. If you just look at the temperature below 450 um, Kelvin, you'll find that they're kind of it's operating, if they're a little bit elevated temperature, like 100 degrees centigrade, they're going to be operating at 6 tenths of the absolute melting point, and so they're in the creep regime. Um, as a rule, now this is a very rough rule of th thumb, but I find that I can kind of do a quick in my head calculation of uh, solders, and if the, the, the stress on a solder joint is a thousand PSI or greater, no good, okay? Uh, typically, you don't want to see stresses more than 100 PSI or a couple hundred PSI, which is one megapascal, 145 PSI. So you don't like high stresses on solders. In fact, uh, sprinkler systems, if you look up here, you got this little white circle here. If we had a fire here, that would pop down and there would be well, I don't know if it'd be a glass bulb type of sprinkler system or it'd be the old Woods metal. Woods metal melts at 156 degrees, or no, 165 degrees Fahrenheit, and it would essentially melt and start spraying the room with water. Uh, so low melting solders, I mean, there's been a big controversy because historically, going back 100 years, people have said don't use Woods metal sprinkler systems, don't let them get to above 100 degrees Fahrenheit because if you do they will fail and they fail by a creep mechanism. Okay, Well solder, if you will, Woods metal is just a uh, solder type compound, low melting metal and solders fail at low temperatures. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit, I just handed out this summary which comes out of a a book by a guy named Manko who wrote a number of books on soldering, but this is sort of a summary um, for what's good and what's bad in lead tin solder baths. Now maybe this is getting a little bit old, but people figure, oh it's solder, it's not a big deal. Um, and I've told you about some of the things that are sort of critical. Well the composition is critical. Remember I talked about wave soldering, um, the way we solder pr printed circuit boards. I guess I think I have a a picture in here of a wave solder. I showed it to you once before, but anyway, here it is. So here's the the wave solder bath, and you have a printed circuit board. You mount your components on here, and it used to be you always had um, all your little wires sticking all the way through. We're going to show you that's not the way you do it anymore. You actually are going to take the actual le electronic components and they're going to have to survive the heat of the solder bath. You spray on a flux and you uh, um, just pass it across this wave of, of solder. Well, this bath down here will slowly pick up contaminants. I mean, that might be a bath of several tons of solder that you're just pumping continually. But you've got copper up here. You could have other types of components on the... On the uh, on the, uh, other metals on the components and if you pick up very much contamination you find that 50 parts per million of aluminum, magnesium or zinc now zinc could be in a lot of things, okay, we use it for corrosion protection but it would easily get into that solder bath it'll form intermetallics and those intermetallics start to act like sand in the solder bath and so now they get in and they interfere with the joint and the wetting and flow of the solder. 
We actually add up to three tenths of a percent of antimony. In fact, today we use antimony uh, silver solders, um, primarily antimony, because it improves wetting. Antimony, like lead oxide, are fairly stable oxides, um, and it will actually help do some of the cleaning off the surface. Okay. Um, however, you read a bunch of old specs, and it'll say you have to put the antimony in to. Re to uh, avoid tin pest. And tin pest is the fact that pure tin will transform from white tin to gray tin with a maximum transformation temperature of minus 18 degrees centigrade. And it was once thought, turns out it's not true, it was once thought that when actually it goes from monoclinic to triclinic. And when it does this, your tin will turn to powder. Okay. Uh, and actually it happened to the Russians uh, in World War II. They had a, a big stockpile of tin outdoors um, that they were storing and the winter came along, everything got covered with snow and in the spring when the snow melted they found they had a pile of not tin ingots but tin powder because it got to minus 18 degrees centigrade um, or thereabouts which is the maximum transformation temperature. This question was on my doctoral exam by the way. Um, uh, of t not tin pest, but the maximum transformation temperature of, of gray tin to white tin and going through the kinetics and stuff of, I mean, do I care? I mean, if I'm a Russian general, I'm just irritated I got a bunch of tin oxide now rather than uh, tin, tin ingots, but in any case. Um, but I could calculate it at that time in my life, okay? At least I guess I could. Um, I don't remember if I could or not. In any, <laughs> I got a pass. Who cares? So anyway, it just transformed, and people thought that this would happen in the lead tin alloys. It turns out, not only does antimony inhibit it, but lead inhibits it, and it doesn't take very much to slow down that that reaction. And it turns out, if you look at the lead tin phase diagram, there's some solubility for lead in tin and tin in lead. Um, and so it turns out that's not the reason to put it in, but it does improve wetting. And nowadays we use it to improve strength of the solders and make the solders. Arsenic and iron, again, uh, it might be 200 parts per million or, or uh, I mean, it might be 500 parts per million or 200 parts per million, but they form intermetallics. Bismuth, just like antimony, can help wetting. Uh, destroys recyclability of steel, but aside from that, it's not a problem. Um, cadmium. A lot of people think, oh, it's CAD plated, no problem in soldering. Turns out 10 parts per million um, uh, in lead or tin segregates in the solder bath and creates dross formation, which are all these oxides floating on the surface which interfere with the wetting. Um, you can have up to 800 parts per million copper or gold. Uh, copper you don't care so much. Uh, although if you get above that, you actually start forming some inner metallics and you do care. Copper, tin, inner metallics. Gold, you idiot, if you've got 800 parts per million gold, send it out to the refinery and get your money back. Okay, I mean, but you will slowly dissolve the gold on some of these compounds, uh, some of these integrated circuits and stuff. But you usually don't ever let the gold get that high. <laughs> okay. Um, nickel is rarely fi found, but it's not really harmful. Silver, um, we sometimes add to the solder bath, but it's expensive. Sulfur. Sulfur, seven parts per million. It forms a copper sulfide. The copper sulfide is more stable than the copper oxide. Most of the copper ores we find in the world are sulfide ores, not oxides. Since copper sulfide is more stable than copper oxide, guess what? A lot of the fluxes, and particularly a non-activated rosin flux, won't clean off copper sulfide. So small amounts of copper sulfide just destroy wettability. Um, and this goes not just for lead tin alloys, but um, some of these same things apply to some of the other types of uh, things that we use in, in soldering. And so even though you have this wave soldering system, about once a week or so, or so you basically take that two tons of solder, pour it out of the bath, solidify it, send it to the refinery, and put some new solder in there. If you're in a big shop that's doing, if you're doing wave soldering, you're doing thousands upon thousands of printed circuit boards a week. So it's not that big a cost to recycle it. Because if you don't, you're going to find all kinds of defect problems showing up. Um, yes? 
Pardon me? How do they recycle? How do they pull out all the They basically go back to uh, uh, the way you kind of clean up lead and tin to begin with. Um, uh, you don't have to go all the way back to the ore process, but you do essentially, uh, actually I have to ask Harold Larson how they would clean some of these things up. Um, you're not going to put sulfur in there. Some of them you can oxidize out, like aluminum and magnesium, and you can filter them out. You can, I mean, it's a low enough melting liquid that you can filter out these intermetallics and the oxides, so you could bubble some oxygen through it. I'm not sure if that's exactly what they do. Um, I don't think you'd be using chlorides in most cases, but another way, way to clean aluminum out of a system is to bubble chlorine through it, molten aluminum. We used to do it all the time up in the foundry, just exhaust it to the Cambridge air. You know, you bubble chlor chlorine through the bath and well, up comes bubbles of chlorine with hydrochloric gas, hydrogen chloride gas. That was back in the days when you could pollute with, you know, it was all acceptable, okay? Nowadays, if they thought there was a hydrogen chloride molecule, even a single molecule, you would probably be threatened with a jail term uh, for polluting. Uh, but back in the old days, we used to bubble chlorine all the time through the aluminum to clean it up. Um, there, are, there is some other science that you ought to be aware of. And this concept of a bond number, which I kind of apply to um, soldering, but it applies to uh, welding, spatter, when you're welding steel or aluminum or anything else. If I'm just interested, remember metals have higher surface energies than other things. If I, but it doesn't matter, the bond number applies to any types of particles, even small aerosol particles if you sneeze, sneeze and things like that. What size particle is stable and what will form spheres and what will form uh, egg-shaped drops. And the bond number is a dimensionless number. Are all of you familiar with dimensionless numbers? I know you are because you're a mechanical engineer. You are because you're a mechanical engineer. What about you materials folks? Do you, you dimensionless numbers like the Reynolds number or the Peclet number or something like that? So everyone's so dimensionless numbers are just take an energy over an energy or a force over a force or something like that. In this case, we're going to take the gravitational energy or a gravitational force over the surface tension force. So you can do it as forces, but you can do it as energies as well. Uh, and that's called the bond number. It has nothing to do with joining, okay? It just happens to be called the bond number. But you take, and you say, okay, I'm going to take some sphere that has some height um, uh, above the surface, and I want to know if that's going to be spherical or if it's going to be uh, an ob oblate spheroid, you know, elliptical in shape. And the gravitational pressure is rho gh, okay, that's how much pressure down here from the weight of the metal up above, and rho is the density of the metal, which is pretty high, and the surface tension pressure is 2 gamma over r if it's a sphere. Now, if it's a, an ellipse, it's not a single value of r, but they're close to the same value. This is just getting dimensionless. r is about h over 2, and if you go through all this and take the ratio, rho g 2r divided by 2 gamma over r, you get the bond number is rho g r squared over gamma. Well, so what? It turns, pardon me? Surface tension. Surface tension or surface energy. If you put in one joule, for, per uh, meter squared, which is a thousand dimes per centimeter squared, you put in a density of about 10 grams per cubic centimeter, you put in gravity, which is 980 dimes per centimeter, and you put in a radius, well, you want to solve for a radius if the bond number is one. At what value is the gravitational energy and the surface energy equal, okay? And that's when it's going to start to slump because of gravity. Anything smaller than this, well, if you put in those numbers, you get r squared is equal to a tenth. Square root of a tenth is 0.3 centimeters, which is 3 millimeters. If you want to be exact, it's 3.16 centimeters, but who, I mean, 3.16 millimeters, but I didn't use even one significant figure in doing my calculation, so I can hardly use three later. Um, in any case, three millimeters, or an eighth of an inch, is sort of where 
you would start to think that your solder below that should form nice symmetric geometric shapes when it is bonded on a circuit board and above that's when it's going to start to slump and this comes out of the Klein Wassing book um, these are joints they made on the old-fashioned wire through a hole and then soldering it and over here they didn't have enough solder on these and they kept on putting increasing amounts of solder they start to get a decent fillet right here they put too much solder on there and they start getting the whole thing clumping up and in fact depending on the size of this it may be still be surface tension at this point but you can get to the point when you're dealing with molten metal powders whether it's spatter whether it's doing powder metallurgy trying to make powder metals if it's less than an eighth of an inch in diameter it probably is going to form a sphere naturally and if it's larger than that it's going to slump and it's going to gravity is going to be the dominant force okay provided there's not you know in welding the drops come off with some velocity and they hit and they it's actually called spatter when it comes off once it hits some solid object it's called splatter right it splatters all over everywhere just like dropping a cat from a hundred story building I guess they land under their feet but who cares at that point anyway uh, actually I don't know if I should say this on tape I actually tried it once with a cat to see how quickly they can turn okay and it turns out it only takes about eight or ten inches and they can flip themselves around if you hold them upside down and anyway I was doing it on a sofa okay I was just you know so the cat did and the cat really didn't mind <laughs> he just he, he wasn't upset pardon me <laughs> well actually I did do it several times to see it because he basically turns he, he rotates his his torso because he has no angular momentum right and he has to create angular momentum so he actually turns his rear legs this way to hit the ground and he turns the other way with his upper torso if you will because he has to conserve angular momentum i'm sure he worked out all the physics um, equations to uh, to do that but i was i was curious once they do land on their feet though um, in any case so now let's talk a little bit about soldering for microelectronics or interconnect and the folks doing interconnect putting together electronic circuits actually have a system for what they call the interconnect level if I'm trying to make joints on the chip on the piece of silicon so I'm putting I'm putting little aluminum or copper or whatever conductors on this semiconductor chip that's called level zero it's called levers level zero because the guys who are making printed circuit boards and assembling them probably forgot about that level of interconnection so they went back to zero where they found someone said oh yeah we make joints uh. now does anybody know what we're using in the best electronic circuits now as a the interconnect metal on the chip it was a big announcement about 15 years ago by IBM just hit all the pa front pages of the papers around the world and stuff they used to use aluminum and the reason they used aluminum aside from the fact it's easy to vapor deposit aluminum onto a chip through all the you know the mask and the and stuff that you would put on there the polymer mask so you could vapor deposit it and make little lines connection between the little uh, tr uh, transistors and stuff was because a little bit of aluminum contamination didn't destroy the semiconductor properties of silicon they would have loved to have used copper but they couldn't until probably the late 90s IBM announced they had come up with this mystery bonding layer or inner diffusion layer that would prevent inner diffusion of copper into the silicon so it wouldn't destroy the semiconductor properties of the silicon well the mystery material turns out to be tungsten okay now why would you use tungsten you put on a little layer of tungsten tungsten is a very heavy element very high melting point diffuses very slowly Duh. okay so anyway this was a big secret for about 
three or four months until a couple of people who knew something about diffusion thought about it and said, well, it's obvious you use tungsten. Okay, and that's in fact what they used. But now they use copper. And why do they use copper? Um, because back in the mid-90s, they were actually, if you go back and look at how fast the semiconductor chip is, I mean, right now, if you go buy a new laptop or something, it'll have an Intel chip in it, and it will be running at what frequency? A variable, but around what frequency? Three gigahertz, good number, I like it, okay? Um, back in the, in 1990 or so, these things were running at one and a half, two gigahertz, and they could keep on, if you went from the 1980s up through the 90s, um, you would just pay more to get higher speed. Well, does anyone know why we sort of pooped out for the last 10 or 15 years at three gigahertz? We poop out because of the speed of light, okay? If the speed of light is three times 10, oops, I may have this wrong, um, 10 to the eighth, uh, that's right, meters per second, okay? And wavelength is the speed of light times time, if I got that right? And I do 3 times 10 to the 8th divided by 3 gigahertz, which is 1 over time, I will get 0 0.1 meter, 10 centimeters. That's how far light can travel at 3 gigahertz. Okay? This, you might say, well, that's a lot bigger than the chip. Well, it is bigger than the chip. But there are things that actually slow that down. That's if electrons were flowing through the metal at the speed of light. They don't actually go at the speed of light. They might go at one tenth of that. So in ten of ten, instead of 10 centimeters, they may only go one centimeter. Or maybe they go two centimeters because of capacitance and parasitic, well, parasitic capacitance and resistance. Um, one of the things they do on chips nowadays is they almost will always have a metallic backplane. Uh, this one has a layer of gold on it. They want to have that as a ground plane to prevent parasitic capacitance because it will slow these things down. You don't usually have to worry about inductance at this size scale, but you do have to worry about capacitance, okay? And so it turns out Another reason, not just thermal expansion, but another, another reason for making the chips only one centimeter on size, and, and I told you about bonding into similar materials, but it's also, you make much bigger that, you gotta start worrying about all these speeds and how the electrons from one end of the chip get over to the other end of the chip to do their work, okay? And back at one point, I told you the Pentium 6 had two chips on a tab tape instead of just one. It was one that was about a centimeter square, the other was about six tenths of a centimeter square. And I think the other one was basically a bunch of memory. But this was back around 2000, the year 2000 or late 90s or something. Nowadays, they can get so many transistors on a single chip. We're up to almost 100 million transistors on a chip now or something like that. They can put, they can cram everything onto one chip, okay? But in the old days, which is about the time you were born, okay, um, they had a problem because the distances that the electrons had to go were getting into a range that was limiting the speed. What they do now is they, the chips have enough components on them that they actually can do a lot of their work on the chip and then just pass other information to something else, and now they have parallel processors. The world's supercomputers are bigger than the size of this room, and uh, they still have to communicate, you know, not over just 10 centimeters, but over tens of meters from one chip to another. They might have 64,000 computer chips and cost billions of dollars, but they, they still have to communicate, and so, how do you keep track of all these separate little 
parallel processing calculations and bring them together to end up with something very quickly is an architect's nightmare, okay? Uh, but that's what electrical engineers do in, this type, in that particular area of the business. But in the old days, people used to worry about how many input outputs you could get on the chip. And they still do to a certain extent. Um, there was something called rent's rule but I, that I have not heard about for about 12 years. But rent's rule was sort of like Moore's law. Moore's law says the cost of uh, semiconductor or transistors goes down a factor of, what, two every year and a half, 18 months or something. Uh, well, rent's rule said the number of inputs and outputs on a semiconductor chip increased with the number of transistors on the chip to, let's see if I may have it. <coughs> Uh, Rent's rule was uh, number of circuits goes as capital N to the N power, okay, with some constants in between, where N was somewhere between 1.5 and 3, that's the exponent, okay, with 1.79 being the best fit, okay, well, three significant figures, that's great. Um, in any case, you, you might, if you increase the number of transistors by a factor of 100, you'd have 10 times as many inputs and outputs. And so if you look in the old days, the old days being when I was um, in my youth, okay, you might have a semiconductor package that looks like this. This is from the late 70s, early 80s, where you have a little semiconductor. I actually used to have the semiconductor, but I lost it that goes in here and there's, you could count these on here, but it probably doesn't have more than um, three dozen connections, inputs and outputs. And the semiconductors in there, and this is a piece of 97% aluminum oxide filled with a bunch of gold or tungsten vias inside, okay? This is a composite, a metal ceramic composite from the 1980s and this is your number of inputs and outputs that you're going to push onto a printed circuit board. Look at how much real estate that takes. They do call it real estate on the printed circuit board. Okay? That's, you know, 30-year-old, 40-year-old technology. Then people came up with little square things like this that had, that's called perimeter bonding. This is area bonding. So you'd have a chip that fits in about the same size as that and you'd have the little wire bonds that would go from, you'd solder the chip onto the aluminum oxide. Um, there's actually a ground plane on the back here, but it actually is it's a millimeter away. You couldn't have that today, okay? But this probably is mid-80s type of technology, 286 computer or something, right? Um, and you have little wire bonds on here. And you look and say, oh, that's pretty close even for a wire bond. I'll talk to you about how close. And on the back side, they actually have a bunch of little dots. That's a perimeter array where you bond, actually not even a square perimeter, two lines. This is an area array, okay? And this is a, uh, what do they call these? Basically, it's a bunch of pins. It's similar. And you can see they, they have a bunch of wire bonds on here and then they have the connections and you would just plug this in, turn it in upside down and plug it into the printed circuit board. That was all well and good until the mid 90s uh, or 2000 and because of miniaturization of laptops and cell phones they couldn't deal with electronic packages where your whole component took up a bunch of real estate because of the aluminum oxide housing that it was in that you plugged into some socket on the circuit board. Cell phones needed to be miniaturized. I wish I kept my old first cell phone. I mean, the old first cell phone was the size of a, wasn't a shoe box, but it was, uh, uh, it was probably about that square and about that long. And, you know, it, you could fit it in your pocket, but it looked like you're carrying around a can of soda in your pocket. Okay, because it's about the size of a soda can. And it had range, I mean, it had range from here to the building next door, okay? I mean, it was great. And if you walked underneath a power line, whoa, forget that conversation. I'm talking about dropping conversation. Cell phones have improved. And it also, it cost me $3,500, okay? 
I remember the first cell phone I ever had, a, a guy from Motorola, Vice President of Motorola was visiting and I had him over for dinner and he had one of the first cell phones and at that time, if you could buy one, they cost about $10,000. This was about 1990 or so. Anyway, so here we have what they call tab bonding, tape automated bonding. I'll pass this around, you can look at it again. It actually has about 400 inputs and outputs around the perimeter. And what they did, the reason Intel would do this, you have what you call interlead bonds, which Intel would make and make the chip to the tab tape. And they would sell you this little cartridge with the tab tape. And by the way, about 1995, when Intel was, gave me these things, the tab tape would cost you about 50 bucks a piece. Okay? And I had a bunch of high school students coming in for a Saturday at MIT, and I called up a friend who was one of the, his badge number was less than 1,000 at Intel, and go by your, your higher date was your badge number. Uh, so he was one of the first 1,000 people. And uh, he had taken me over to meet Craig Barrett, who was the, became the CEO. But Craig Barrett was a material science professor at Stanford who left in his youth to go to this, one of the first people at this company called Intel that Gordon Moore was founding. And uh, so Gene Myron, who's a graduate of this department and is an Intel fellow, I was down at, in Chandler, Arizona, and said, I want you to meet Craig Barrett who at the time was president of Intel. So we go rushing through all these buildings about three quarters of a mile, and we get to Craig Barrett's office, and he had a cubicle, just like all the other people with cubicles, and his secretary had a cubicle. His cubicle was about 50% larger than the average person's cubicle. But this was sort of Intel's culture at the time. They did have conference rooms, uh, but everybody could use the conference rooms for meeting, meetings of two or three people. So you could have a private room if you were going to fire somebody or something. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, so I met Craig Barrett uh, at that time. And they, anyway, I, I called up Gene when I had to, I was department head and I needed to have some touchy feelies to give the students. So I went, we ended up giving them a turbine blade. I got Pratt & Whitney to give me a couple hundred turbine blades that were old turbine blades. And I got Intel to, to give me some of these, and they were about 500 of them. I didn't realize at the time, you know, at 50 bucks a pop for the tape. Um, but these were actually test pieces, the ones that don't have a chip. I only have one that remains that actually has a bad Pentium 5 chip. It's got a little dot on it. Um, but in any case, Intel would make the inner lead bonds, and you could make your own outer lead bonds directly on a printed circuit board. This was called chip on board. Okay, so chip on board technology allowed people to get rid of all those aluminum oxide packages. And they don't really exist much anymore except in kind of low end electronics um, because they're expensive to make those packages in general. But so the packaging, when you're bonding from the chip to the package, which is all those things I passed around, I'm kind of giving you a history. And then you go from the packet, package to the printed circuit board. And you know what a printed circuit board looks like. I passed this around, maybe I didn't pass around once. This is a printed circuit board. It's got 21 layers, okay? And it's basically a bunch of plastic sheets that are, have different patterns on them. You have to put them together in the right, right array. And you press them together and adhesively bond them in a vacuum furnace under pressure. So there's a big adhesive bonding problem. And you end up with, and you also have to then do some things to make connections between each one of these holes on here. And you can put your chips directly on there without those big packages. And a smaller one looks like this. I think this is from about 19, late 19, 1997. Cisco Systems says on here, okay? So if you're trying to run the internet, this is going to go through one of these. Um, they used to make these up at a little plant in New Hampshire. I had a student work up there. And they had lots of quality control problems because you make something this complex. This one's not 21 thick. This is probably only 14, 13 or 14 layers thick. But can you imagine how many tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars of electronic components are going to go on here? 
And every single one of these vias, every single one of these holes, has to make a connection. If it doesn't, you got a horrendous, if, if very many of them don't, you got a horrendous quality control problem and how do you repair it and stuff. And you really don't want to throw it out, okay, after you've put everything on it. This is an excellent example of where I told you that joining often comes late in the, in the process of the manufacturing of a component when most of the value is already in the part, okay? So they had automatic scanners of each one of these sheets. I, oh, I should have brought one of the sheets. One of the little, my, they're not mylar, they're, but one of the little sheets is kind of flexible and they'd stack these up. I do have one back in my office that I'll try to remember to bring next time. But uh, so by the mid 90s, we're getting rid of the aluminum oxide packages. We're going to chip on board and we're getting things smaller and smaller. Um, and the number of inputs and outputs is going up. Except it didn't keep going up. Back in the early 90s, the Defense Department made, I think I told you, some two inch or chips that were one to two inches on a side where they were integrating everything all on one chip to beat this time limitation of the gigahertz and everything because it takes, it still takes time. You got parasitic capacitances and the stuff on here, you can't go three gigahertz to, from one corner of this board to the other board, other corner of the board. If you're going to be operating at three gigahertz, you got to do everything in a very small area. So the military chips at the time, the secret military chips at the time, were manufactured in a, Motorola had a facility that was about 10% of their business, and all they did was make classified military electronics, special chips for the military. So anyway, let's finish up and telling you about the, the different levels of interconnect. We talked about on the chip, which I'm not going to talk about other than saying we now use copper because of its lower resistance so that we can go to higher frequencies. We wouldn't be getting three gigahertz today if IBM hadn't figured out how to put a layer of tungsten down as a diffusion barrier for copper. We would still be using aluminum. Package to the printed board, well, we don't really do that. We actually put the chip directly on. So we sort of, uh, I'm sorry, chip the package, chip the package. We sort of eliminated step one, okay? Or in level one, because we go directly from the chip to the printed circuit board, which is level two, the board to the subsystem. That's within a cabinet, okay? So you got a, you got a, an audio amp and you buy it and you put it into your audio system, that's that little thing that's you know 18 inches across by 10 inches deep by three or four inches high, you've got a bunch of interconnects in there and these things plug into little connectors and there's uh, a company called AMP. Anybody heard of AMP out of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania? Uh, you ever heard of the Whitakers, Whitaker College here at MIT? Okay, the Whitakers Uncas Whitaker started a company called AMP, the world's largest manufacturer of kind of uh, level um, three packaging. Okay, all those little plug-in connectors, you, you pull a printed circuit board out. Nowadays, if you're complicated, whatever it is, goes on the fritz, and you're lucky enough to have someone, or you see a repairman comes in, all he does is he's got a full set of circuit boards, he just pulls them out until the thing starts working. And when it starts working again, he, he leaves that board with you, charges you $5,000 for the replacement board. He takes the other board back to the factory and someone repairs it, okay? And then they sell it to somebody else for $5,000, okay? But in any case, subsystem to the system, well, that could be you now put a bunch of these into a relay rack, which, you know, stands as tall as a person and has got a whole bunch of these things. Or it could be cables running from this part of the supercomputer to that side of the part of the supercomputer, but now you got all kinds of complex cables. If you want, you can think of an automobile, okay? You've got all kinds of electronics that have to communicate with each other. Uh, automobiles today, um, about 25% of the cost of an automobile is what? Healthcare, okay? A uh, third of the cost of an automobile is electronics. 10% of the cost of an automobile is steel, okay? 
costs about $500 for the steel that goes in an automobile. Okay, but anyway. Um, sort of amazing. Anyway, so those are the different la levels of interconnect uh, technology. If you look, I didn't bring the book with me, but um, there's a, a book that's getting a little bit old now, but actually this is not the book I was thinking of, but anyway, this is the introduction to surface mount technology, which is chipped directly, directly on the printed circuit board, and they, this is the quality that they had in their thing, but through hole, which is that dual, that dip package, that dual in line, the first one I handed out with two layers of, two rows of, of uh, you know, a couple of dozen things, that's a dual in line package. Uh, I can't remember what some of these, this is PG pin grid array, I passed around that thing with a bunch of pins, that's a pin grid array, that's about early 1980s. Then there's um, uh, multi-chip modules, which actually had these little gull wings coming off the side, but they're still in these aluminum oxide packages. There's flip chip, I passed around a flip chip, which is around 2000, okay? And that's as far as this thing went. Because really, after 2000, you get to chip on board uh, type of technology. But nonetheless, let's talk, because whether you're doing chip on board or you're putting into an aluminum oxide package, you still have to worry about perimeter bonding or um, area ray bonding. Um, and people were worried about this uh, for the last 40 or 50 years, because they could you know, IBM would predict and say, where are we going to be? In fact, that's why we have a transistor. Um, in about 1925, AT&T, which was called Bell Laboratories back then, or Bell, the Bell system, was looking at all the mechanical switches. They, I think I may have told you this before. Um, you know, people always say that the transistor came out of basic research. No. AT&T in about 1925 was looking at how many mechanical switches they had in their system. And they, they started something that was a reliability group, a bunch of statisticians who were looking at how to make the system more efficient. Okay? And they um, projected that sometime by about 1960, 35 years hence, the whole system would come to a screeching halt because the reliability of mechanical switches was about, had a failure rate about um, one in 10,000 per 10 years or something like that, okay? They call it fits, failures in time. If you're in the semiconductor business, they talk about fits, okay? Failures in time. But it was this, these guys in the, um, in the 1920s and 1930s at, at Bell Labs that were looking at this type of stuff and they came to the conclusion they needed to come up with an electronic switch because the mechanical switches were not going to have the reliability you know, 30, 40 years hence. And so it turns out Bardeen and, uh, who were the two guys? Bardeen and uh, Shockley. Bardeen and Shockley invented the transistor not because they were doing basic research, because they were trying to come up with an electronic switch. That's exactly what they were doing. Is applied research, so forget all this basic research stuff uh, about the, the transistor came out of basic research. But in any case, um, IBM was looking at these same things in the 1960s, when you only had a thousand transistors on a chip, okay? So you got a one centimeter chip, four tenths of an inch in diameter. If you're doing wire bonding, the closest you can get together are these little dots around the outside is about seven thousandths because the wire is one thousandths but that little needle head that goes in four, you know I told you it looks like a sewing machine head needle that has to have uh, about three and a half three thousandths on either side so with four sides you can get 230 inputs and outputs around this thing connections a tab bonded tape like we have there and the one you have I think is about 360 rather than 400 but if you've got Four, four centimeters on the perimeter, and you've got four thousandths of an inch, 100 microns between them, okay, you basically uh, have 400. And that was all you could really get unless you went to area bonding, which the military did in the early 90s, but now everybody did. Area or array bonding 
invented by IBM in the 1960s. Never used because it wasn't needed. It was sort of IBM saw they were going to need more and some folks got together and said, let's do C4, control collapse chip connection. And all you would do is you'd have these little solder pads just like that thing I passed around, which didn't have 2,000 of them on it. But your connections will be on these little, little pads and you'll have a solder ball. And you can get up to 2,000, theoretically, before you start running into thermal expansion problems, okay, of these things just shearing themselves apart. And that's the way most of the chips are done today. Not for 2,000 inputs and outputs, because I think Rent's rule has sort of pooped out. When we can get 100 million transistors on a chip, we don't need as many inputs and outputs. In fact, I used to say that back when I first learned about Rent's rule. 15 or 20 years ago, I said, it can't last forever. Because at some point, all you want is about 10 inputs and outputs. Everything will be on one chip. And so you're not going to need 5,000 inputs and outputs. But other people say, oh, no, no, you're going to need 5,000 inputs. I said, that's ridiculous. At some point, you go over the peak and you start having fewer, needing fewer inputs and outputs. So, okay, so there's area bonding and perimeter bonding. Um, Here's the little sewing machine for wire bonding. I think I've shown you something like this before. Uh, this was ultrasonic because it's talking about a sonotrode. Okay, so it's ultrasonic. It says ultrasonics wedge bonding, and you you make it make something on one little pad here, and then you make another bond here. And these are the types of bonds that I mentioned. I think I mentioned to you. It's about 50 trillion of these made a year, is what I estimated about 10 years ago. Um, if you think about it, the reliability has to be huge, okay? Uh, because one bad joint out of 400, actually one bad joint out of 800, okay? Because there's an inner lead bond and an outer lead bond. One out of 800 and the whole thing is junk, okay? Now, you might try to repair them, but it's not that easy to repair things that are only 100 microns across. People do it when you're talking about a $500 chip. But if you're talking about a $50 chip, you can't afford to do it, okay? So here's the encapsulation I was talking about. You basically have to protect that chip from any corrosion and moisture and other things that are going on. And if you know the questions on that, probably a good stopping point because I'm starting to see the vultures out there, okay?